I have nothing to do with it. I've been out of Atlantic City for many years. I think most people know that. Uh, I've got out. Some people would say good timing, but I got out many, many years ago. And I see what's happening in Atlantic City. There's just too much competition. There's too much pressure from Pennsylvania, Maryland. And ultimately, everybody's going to do badly because they're looking at casinos as a panacea. But uh, I left Atlantic City about eight years ago, uh, haven't been involved. My name is on the building, and uh, it's one of those things. But uh, Atlantic City, is it's a very sad situation, just too much competition. Can it ever recover from where uh, They'll happened? change the form of Atlantic City, and something else will happen. It does have one very big advantage. It's sitting on the ocean. And, you know, it's funny. I've always had a lot of great success on oceans, rivers, and lakes. Right up the road from D.C., I have a great golf course, a great club called Trump National Golf Club, Washington, D.C., and it's on the Potomac River. And anytime you have something on an ocean, a river, or a lake, it's really hard to blow it. So I think Atlantic City can come back. It's got to use the asset of the Atlantic Ocean. What went wrong? I mean, it, you... you like well, the politicians many, made... Yeah, the politicians made many mistakes in Atlantic City. And one of the big mistakes, they built a convention center in the wrong location. And I used to fight them years ago. This is many years ago. And I'd say, just take the existing boardwalk hall and add three walls and a roof, and you have a much bigger, better center and a good location. They decided to do it their way. They built a convention center in the absolute wrong location, the worst, and then they didn't have hotel rooms, and it was too small. And they would have had a much bigger one for one-third the cost. So after that happened, I sort of said to myself, this is ridiculous. I don't want to listen to anybody. They made a lot of mistakes over the years in Atlantic City. But I have a warm spot for Atlantic City, but I've been gone for many years. Has in your view, has Chris Christie done enough to try and revitalize it? Well, he's trying very hard to revitalize it, and he's working very hard. He's got some very good people working on it, and uh, it's, it's tough. You have tremendous competition surrounding it. And by the way, that competition is starting to eat away at itself. So ultimately, the great panacea, which is casinos, will not be the panacea. Do you regret at all that your name's on the building? I think everyone knows that I'm gone. Uh, Atlantic City was a, a place that I really loved. Uh, you know, I did it for a long time in Atlantic City. But a lot of people say when I left, that's when it went bad. And in one way, I'm honored by that statement. But in another way, I feel badly about Atlantic City. Florida never went all in on gambling. But someone did. Atlantic City, New Jersey. Boomtown. Bust town and inspiration for the first version of the board game Monopoly. If Henry Flagler's railroads caused Florida to rise up out of the swamp, then Jonathan Pitney's railroads caused Atlantic City to emerge from the sands. The first Atlantic City boardwalk was built in 1870. Its main purpose, help keep sand out of hotel lobbies. By the early 20th century, Atlantic City was on a high-octane building boom. Larger and more impressive hotels began to replace the smaller inns that had once housed guests. And Josiah White's Marlboro Blenheim Hotel, built on the site now occupied by Bally's Casino, was among the most distinctive. Fueled by Prohibition-era nightclubs and restaurants, the 1920s is widely considered Atlantic City's golden age. But by the end of World War II, Atlantic City was in decline. High-speed jet travel and a rising middle class opened access to subtropical destinations, and soon, places like Miami Beach had eclipsed Monopoly City. Then, the casinos moved in. Desperate, Atlantic City opened its doors. Atlantic City became bankrupt, if not officially, then practically speaking. It had almost nothing going for it in terms of economic activity. And it was um, what I think the casino industry seizes upon, which is desperate. The whole idea was these casinos were going to come in and revitalize this dying seaside town. And people were gullible and they fell for it. I was supportive of a casino uh, gambling in Atlantic City because I felt it could provide a catalyst to revitalize this once great resort area in the state of New Jersey. If I knew you know, then what I know now, clearly I would not have supported it. When I, when I look back at what 
happened or more accurately did not happen. The promises never came to fruition. The revitalization of Atlantic City never, never came. I mean, if you go to Atlantic City today and you walk a couple of blocks off the boardwalk, you still see the same decay and even worse than when this was uh, approved, you know, over 30 years ago. You know, when casinos first came to Atlantic City, I think people were super excited there, the business owners, the merchants, everybody's all geared up. Wow, these casinos are going to bring all these people in. It's going to be a big boom for all of us. And it didn't take a whole lot of time to figure this out, that it was actually hurting their businesses. The casinos are masters at sucking the people in and keeping them there and then sending them home. Before long, 40% of Atlantic City restaurants and a third of its local retailers had gone out of business. Far from curing Atlantic City's economic woes, casino gambling made them worse. The real tragedy, I think, of the casino gambling expansion story is that as small businesses disappear, as restaurants go out of business, as other businesses can't compete, what you have is a casino-driven local economy. Then you really are in a bind. Then what you have to do is support the one big industry in town, which is the casino, which continues to extract wealth from the community. So it's a downward spiral. I'll never forget the time that my director gave me his philosophy or his understanding of his job. At that time, I looked at him as a, I wanted to see him as a mentor. But his concept was that his job, his duty, was to keep the players in this rat maze, to keep them, how can you keep them in here as long as you can? There is no partnership with the other businesses or a partnership with anything else in that sort, because it's just, the casino is meant to be the hub. It's meant to be the hub. The gambling industry's promise of jobs and tax revenues gains them entrance to Atlantic City. But after a decade of waiting for promised revenues, authorities finally act. They form a new entity called the Casino Reinvestment Authority. Its purported purpose, force casinos to invest the promised revenues into community redevelopment. It is too late. By this time, the casino industry has already begun to reconfigure the local economy and regulatory system to service itself. I was uh, asked to apply uh, to be the first executive director of the Casino Reinvestment Authority in Atlantic City. And I had a meeting with uh, members, some members of the, of the authority that had just been named and uh, the then mayor of Atlantic City. And we were talking about what needed to be done to uh, revitalize Atlantic City. In a discussion, it became clear that it really wasn't all about revitalizing, but how could we, what was going to be done to support casino gambling, and not what the benefits of casino gambling would be to the community at large. The mayor that Frank Nero met with was James Usury, who would later be arrested with 13 other political figures following an investigation into public corruption. Among other things, he was charged with official misconduct bribery, and conspiracy. Charges were later dropped when he pled guilty to campaign contribution violations. Of the nine most recent mayors, six have been charged with some form of corruption. Gambling is the industry in town, so that those casinos drive policy and they, the lobbyists there uh, basically own all the politicians. You do what the casinos say. The problem with the casino industry, from a, a legislature's point of view, is that everywhere they go, they green the legislature. Uh, and, and the reason why they're different than other industries that lobby a uh, local commission or, or a state legislature is that the amount of money they're going to gain is so fantastical that uh, corrupting a state legislature is simply a cost of doing business. The ribbon cutting for Atlantic City's newest casino, Revel, was hailed by gambling industry analyst Spectrum Gaming as just the tonic Atlantic City needs. About a year later, Revel was bankrupt. To remain afloat, the casino received a tax reimbursement from the state, 
costing more than $260 million. With the local economy now reliant on gambling, casinos have become too big to fail. I've been doing the beach rentals for most of the year and uh, the season's over now, so we're done. Now I'm out of a job. <laughs> There's so many casinos down the East Coast. Every state has casinos now. And uh, um, online gambling, you know, and all that right there takes a big chunk of Lang City. And as a result, uh, a lot of the casinos here are closing. Sad. Our business may be dropping to 50% from what it was in 2008. We are a wholesale manufacturers of Italian bread. We distribute to casinos, supermarkets, mom and pa delis, sub shops, which we're famous for. My grandfather started this bakery 95 years ago. For the first time, in uh, my tenure of 28, 30 years, I'm gonna to have to do layoffs. It's devastating. This is not really a bad thing. Market correction is good. There is no way the Atlantic City could support 13, 11, nine, eight, and possibly five or six casinos, yes. I've been coming here since they opened day one. I, I think it's like 20 years. Because I like it here, it's beautiful, and they treat me nice there. So when I heard it might be closing, oh, it was very terrible to hear that. Oh, I win more than I lost, so that's really good. That's why I still come. <laughs> I've been told that Atlantic City is my new home, and I'm so excited to, to, to call it home and to, to visit as often as I possibly can. Atlantic City has welcomed Miss America back with open arms. Gorgeous. How about jumping? Jump. And I hope that we can continue to, to uh, make sure that Miss America always stays right where she belongs, and that's right here in Atlantic City. So many of us are out of work. You know, like where does eight where do eight thousand people go and think we're going to get hired? This is documentation of the closing of uh, Trump Plaza at uh, five fifty nine fifty four. These things are called Tito's, ticket in, ticket out. They come out of a slot machine. Oh, Where's the little guy at? Oh, I miss Where is he? Tito's. 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 We got people here that started in nineteen eighty four. It's like family. It's like a family reunion. The amount of people that I saw in the 80s, we used to have all the big fights back then with Mike Tyson. It was incredible. There's no other word to describe it but glitz, glamour, and being incredible. Where it is now is nothing like it used to be. The place is just deteriorated um, to the point where it came to the point where they had to shut it down. Your employer here is Trump Plaza Associate. Are you related to the owner? I signed up for unemployment, something I didn't think I would ever 
be doing. I just keep thinking it's my day off. It's my day off today. And uh, it hasn't really sunk in that I'm not gonna be walking into the plaza and working there. The motto of Atlantic City's business people for the last hundred years was three months of hurry and nine months of worry. Atlantic City will rebirth itself and casinos will no longer be the number one generator of the economy. It'll be a diversified economy. I still believe Atlantic City's got potential. We have a beach and we have a boardwalk. Atlantic City's not completely dead yet. Come on back people, we need you. I don't think there's one magical answer. If there was, I think they would have tried it. They kind of just knew they had gambling. They knew they had people coming in. They weren't spending a lot of money back in the city. The town never really was serious about rebuilding the entire town. You know, Atlantic City is very resilient. It has its ups and downs, but it always seems to come back through. The experiment of casino gambling wasn't really maximized the way a lot of people hoped that it would be. So now Atlantic City has to, you know, reinvent itself again. Uh, and I think they have to look to the past in order to do that. Atlantic City was founded based on tourists, and the city's always catered to tourists. Uh, back in 1854, the city was incorporated uh, based on the suggestions of a railroad guy and a doctor. And the doctor, Dr. Pitney, thought that Atlantic City would be a good place for the folks from Philadelphia to come and breathe in some salt air and rest up and relax from the smoggy Philadelphia air. And so we got the railroads involved to build a railroad to bring them from Philadelphia to Atlantic City. The boardwalk is really kind of the main street of Atlantic City. It's, it was the original street and it is the main street. Uh, it started off as boards that were just laid on the sand and they would take them up at the end of the season. They were put there by the hotel men to keep the sand from getting into the hotel lobbies. And so from there it evolved into the permanent street that we see today. It is a street and it's really a, an interesting street. You know, it's the home of the casinos now. It was the home of the big old hotels back then, uh, the piers, and it's really uh, kind of the main stretch for Atlantic City. Local business people quickly saw all the opportunities to make it something more than that. So businesses started popping up along the boardwalk and the boardwalk by the turn of the century is what I've referred to in my book as, as Main Street and Fantasyland USA because it, it had everything you could think of. What made us different is because a lot of other short towns didn't have the boardwalk. Atlantic City ignored prohibition for the most part. Uh, they decided that you know the tourists' needs, the, the visitors' needs were more important. They ignored the, uh, the edict, and so you could still buy alcohol here in Atlantic City. You could still uh, go to clubs and things and, uh, and order a drink. What you have to remember is prohibition did not pop out of the ground like a mushroom. So what you had that preceded the prohibition era was Bishop's Walls, which said no booze on Sunday. And Atlantic City's response to that was, what do you mean no booze on Sunday? That's our busiest day of the week. So when Prohibition came, you had a community that was breaking the law one day a week, faithfully for years. Intellectually, morally, ethically, legally, it ain't a big deal to go from doing something illegal one day a week to doing it illegal seven days a week. And that's what Atlantic City did. And everybody was happy with it. Prohibition did not happen in Atlantic City. And Prohibition, those 14 years, were the zenith of Atlantic City's you know, whole experience. For about a 50 year period, Atlantic City really had the Philadelphia region as a captive audience because people weren't driving cars. And so you got on a train and bam, you're in Atlantic City in less than, you know, less than an hour. Once the automobile and once air traffic uh, made it possible for people to pretty much go for a vacation wherever they wanted, Atlantic City found out it had, it had competition. In about the 1950s or so, Atlantic City started to see a slump in its visitation. More people were going south to Florida because airline travel was much more popular. And air conditioning, home air conditioning and swimming pools uh, meant that people didn't need to go to the ocean to cool off. 
And so Atlantic City really started to see a bit of a decline in the early 1950s from that. They dealt with the competition pretty well until the 60s and the 70s, and then, then it just became too much. Uh, the comp not only the competition, but also what's happened all across America. Atlantic City, in a lot of ways, a microcosm of what happened across America in terms of the hollowing out of a city by people deciding they want to live someplace else. People vote with their feet. And, and a lot of people left Atlantic City the same way people left Camden, they left Trenton, they left Patterson. The introduction of casino gambling came in the 1970s, and Atlantic City has kind of had its ups and downs over the years. And after the slump in the 1950s, casino gambling was seen as a way to bring people back to the city. And so the proposal was put forth to introduce casino gambling here. The voters of New Jersey voted to have it here in Atlantic City. And it really uh, brought in a whole new industry to Atlantic City and to New Jersey. It was the first, uh, it, the first casinos east of the Mississippi at the time. And it was really something new. I know what Atlantic City was like in 1976 when the, when, the, when the gambling referendum was approved. Town, the baseline of the town is better now than it was then, much better. Because you can't imagine how bad Atlantic City was back in the 70s. It was, just, it, was, it was really a place ready to shut out the lights. So casino gambling saved it. I think it was a great thing. I mean, we've had this business for going on 81 years and it was, it was slow for a while. And once the casinos came, business picked up, we started expanding. And we expanded a lot, and, you know, now, I mean, now we're well established, even though the casinos are a little slow, we're still doing good. It's a very positive thing. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't used as effectively as it could have been. In 1978, when Resorts International opened, there was one casino east of the Mississippi. More states in the area have opened up their estates for gambling and for casinos. And so, um, you know, with the added competition, some of the casinos in the city have had to close. When New Jersey first um, legalized casino gambling in the 1970s, we were only the second place in the United States to have casino gambling. And now um, we, and we're the only one on the East Coast. And now there have been so many that have proliferated in Pennsylvania, Delaware, they're coming to New York State, that uh, people don't have to um, go as far as Atlantic City to gamble. Instead of really taking advantage of the position that they had for about 30 years, I'd say close to, the, close to the 25 or 27, but close to 30 years of no competition, you know, east of the, east of the Mississippi, they, they squandered it and this one, one opportunity after another. For too long, the casinos in Atlantic City were satisfied with day trippers, people who just came to play the slots for an afternoon, came by bus, came by car, and then went home the same day. Um, and if people can do that closer to home, they're not going to travel a great distance to do that. There used to be hundreds of buses coming into the city every day, and then, you know, why come in now? They're in Philly, might as well just stay up there, avoid the bus ride. Gambling has become so normal because there's casinos everywhere. You can't, you know, drive a hundred miles without seeing a casino on the East Coast. So as casinos become more nor normalized, it ceases to be something that you want to go on vacation to do. It's not special. The casinos have really been up and down over the years also. You know, it's a one industry town, and so it's an interesting dynamic. When the casinos were coming to Lang City, Property taxes are supposed to be practically zero for people that lived here. They've skyrocketed. They're ridiculous. Mine are ridiculous. My mother still lives in the city. Hers are ridiculous. Back in the early 80s, Atlantic City could have positioned itself in such a way that the major players wouldn't want to compete against themselves. The major players in the casino industry wouldn't want to compete against themselves. But Atlantic City didn't. The boardwalk isn't as nice as it used to be. The beaches aren't as nice as they used to be. I mean, you know. We still have the boardwalk and the beach, but if everybody else has got casino gambling, I mean, you know, if they want to gamble, they're not going to come just for the boardwalk and beach. Politics in City Hall was pretty much about, you know, how do I feather my nest? Uh, how do I look after the people that supported me? And so the vision, there was no vision. What's, what's, the, what's the phrase? Uh, when, there, when there is no vision, the people perish. Well, there is no vision. 
in Atlantic City's government. It hasn't been for a long time. Atlantic City, I think, was a little behind on things. They should have been fixing the city up from day one of the casinos, where I felt that, you know, they kind of just knew they had gambling, they knew they had people coming in, they weren't spending a lot of money back in the city. And now they're trying. I mean, the outlets and everything else they're building are beautiful, but I mean, now everybody else has gambling. At the height, we had 13 casinos, and now we have eight. Uh, in the last couple of years, they've, they've hit on some hard times. Believe me, everybody has their own agenda. Uh, and so is there a vision for the city? No. The present mayor is a very capable guy, but I think he's been handed you know, a mess, and how much he can do with the situation, I think, is you know, pretty limited. Hurricane Sandy affected the city. Um, the eye of the, the storm hit a little north of here in Brigantine, uh, and so we were spared a lot of the property damage here, but it really affected the morale of the city. We had three foot of water downstairs in the bar. My basements were flooded. I lost uh, all my heaters, my electrical panel. We, you know, we were underwater, but uh, you know, that's what you had insurance for, and we got it all back up and running. Other places in the city didn't get affected. The north end did get affected, but there were certain areas that got nothing. Brigantine and all that kind of stuff got affected. I mean, we just, we actually are in a high spot where we're sitting, but you know, it's, we still got a lot of water. Hurricane Sandy hit Atlantic City pretty hard. Um, some places further north in New Jersey got hit even harder. Um, but it was really kind of the third blow of a number of different blows. We had this long-term trend of market saturation, more casinos opening in other places. We had the Great Recession that meant that pe consumers who saw the declining values of their homes, who lost their jobs, were less likely to want to go out and gamble for fun. And then the third blow was Sandy, which really um, hurt a number of people in the local economy. People had their homes flood, a lot of people had um you know, they, they lost personal items and things. Not as many properties were demolished as a result of Hurricane Sandy as in other areas, but it really affected the morale of the city. I don't think there is a quick fix. Um, and so, right, but right now we're just looking for survival in, in terms of the city. I do have a lot of concerns about the state takeover of the city. Um, I'm not convinced that the state knows how to manage the city any better than the local uh, the democratically elected small d democrat, as in democracy, elected political leaders. I think state government having a bigger hand can only do good things. Can't, it can't do bad things. Governor Christie had taken over the tourism district of Atlantic City, and now they're trying to step that up. I'm a, I'm a big believer in democracy, that people have a right to elect their political leaders. Um, and that I think that it is unfortunate if we give the administration of the city over to a bunch of bureaucrats. Um, I think the, we have a cautionary tale in Flint, Michigan, hasn't worked out so well, um, and I'd hate to see that kind of thing happen here. My fear is that if the right steps aren't taken now, the deterioration will continue. We can't just depend on one industry for the city. Um, there needs to be diversification. There's been lots of proposals about making it more family friendly, bringing in water parks, surf, surf pool, pools, and you know all kinds of things that they've been uh, recommended. It'll be interesting to see if you know if they come to be and if families are willing to come here. Um, you know, maybe there's other directions to be explored also. I would like to see us emphasize some of the interesting things that Atlantic City has. Not only the beach and the boardwalk, um, but some of the local history and culture. We have museums. Um, some of the, uh, we have a vibrant arts community. Some of those things I think could attract um, people who are not interested in gambling and that might include families. Um, but I also think that we have to think beyond leisure and hospitality. I'm hopeful. Um, I think a lot of cities go through cycles. Um, Pittsburgh, for example, had a devastated economy and turned it around. I, I'm hoping Atlantic City will do that too. It's going to take major, major changes to correct the problem that the city has. As the old song goes, on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, we will walk in a dream. Lately, that dream has been something of a nightmare with four casinos closing in the last year. Now city leaders are dreaming of a fresh start.
Here's Elaine Quijano. Jason Doyle and his family are enjoying the last few days of summer in Atlantic City, as he's done since he was a kid. All I remember seeing was casinos, but as I got older and now I have children of my own, it's more family oriented. Atlantic City is undergoing a major facelift after a disastrous decline last year when four of the city's 12 casinos shut down, taking almost 8,000 jobs with them. Owners hoping to bring back the crowds have been investing heavily in new family-friendly attractions. This casino changed so much from the last time I was here. You can do the boardwalk, you have the outlets, you can come to this little museum here. That's really cool. This 23,000 square foot art gallery at the Claridge Hotel was a cavernous casino. Jem Ehrenler is the general manager. The Grand Ballroom, it used to be uh, where all poker tables now. We turned this uh, beautiful room into a Grand Ballroom and we are holding 40 plus events. The Tropicana spent $50 million on renovations, including a new gym, light and sound show, and a Havana themed court for restaurants, shops, and nightclubs. Celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay put his name on a pub and grill at Caesars. It's really important that properties in Atlantic City diversify beyond gaming. Mark Giannantonio is the CEO of the Resorts Casino Hotel. We've been able to adapt, and uh, as a result of that, we went from the red to the black. According to a recent study, non-gambling sales within casinos now make up 28.5% of the revenue, up from 22% two years ago. And with that, job prospects are slowly beginning to brighten. About one-third of the jobs lost last year are back. As for the Doyles, more family-friendly options mean more quality time with their kids. For us, it's all about the memories. And for memories, it breeds traditions. So maybe they can bring their kids here and see how much has changed from when I was little till now. Memories the Doyles say they'll cherish as Atlantic City tries to make its future less of a gamble.